Um, we are going to talk today. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Goldman. I work as the Director of Academic Services in the School of Education. Um, today we have a very exciting webinar for you. Um, it is about the creative and effective ways to navigate distant learning in K-12 exceptional needs education. So we have um, our own Dr. Elizabeth Hunter, who is the program chair in the School of Education for the school for um, special education. Um, she is the K-12 special education reading specialist and aut autism certificate program. She's involved in that program. We also have Rachel Copeland, uh, School of Education certification licensure official and SPED reading specialist internship coordinator. So we also have two special guests. We're going to have Dr. Ronnie myers Dobb who is an adjunct professor at Regent University. She's also the Virginia Beach City School Special Education Administrator. She is going to be talking about engaging students in learning activities at home. And then we have Dr. Jason Sears, also an adjunct professor at Regent University and Petersburg City Public Schools principal and special educator. And he is going to be reviewing the administrator view, overview of IEP guidelines, and online teaching and learning for K-12 and exceptional education. Dr. Hunter. Our special education and reading specialist faculty are experts in the field. They are chosen specifically to share their professional experiences regularly with our students at Regent University School of Education. Dr. Sears and Dr. myers Dobb are just two of the spectacular faculty. Enjoy each as they share their expertise with you. Wonderful. Dr. Dobbs? Meyer Dobbs? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about um, reaching out and meeting the needs of students with dis disabilities during this unprecedented time of distance learning. I know many of the schools had to really work quickly in order to figure out what the plan was going to be to address the needs of all students. But obviously in many situations, it, it is also where we had to really think hard of what we're gonna do in order to meet the needs of students with disabilities. And one of the things that you know most people had to focus on initially was that equitable access, because we had to ensure that all students, not knowing all of their circumstances, how are they going to be able to access their education in this distance learning format? So we really focused on looking at whether we were, you know, as divisions looked at whether they're going to record or do live um, teaching. And I know many of the divisions focus more on that recorded lesson in order to provide flexibility for families and students. And those recorded lessons allow students to watch the lessons multiple times. It also allows parents to go back and view those lessons if they have to answer questions to support their students at home. And um, it's also really important for that collaboration piece. General education teachers and special education teachers have to continue to collaborate in order to build the supports for students with disabilities into their lessons, into their videos. You know, and if they're not doing that collaboration and working on videos together, then special education teachers are reacting to the videos that the general education teachers post in order to support students with disabilities. So obviously that collaboration is key to provide more of a uh, normal environment for students because they're, you know, if they're served in the general ed setting, they're used to seeing both of those teachers in their classroom. So the key, you know, in this situation is to try to make things as normal as possible. So it's always important, obviously, to maintain that consistent communication with parents, with students. You know, relationships are key in serving all students. But in this situation, this is really where we, you know, are hoping that those relationships that we have established in the in the school setting are carrying through to support families in this situation. So teachers, it's really important for um, 
teachers to establish, you know, what is their presence going to be on a daily or weekly basis? You know, when are these lessons are going to be provided? When are office hours going to be available? You really have to set those expectations and provide, um, you know, a weekly schedule, particularly for students with disabilities that need that structure and that routine. A lot of divisions are looking at creating, creating like choice formats for um, students. So it still gives them their voice as a student to look at what can they choose to do at this point in time. It's important for us to continue to create visuals and checklists in order to support students as they're trying to navigate through distance learning at home. And because they have many more distractions at home, activities that they may prefer to do, it's important to set up those schedules and those checklists, first then boards if necessary, in order to get them to understand, you know, these are the lessons, these are the activities we need you to complete, and then you can have a break and then you can play Nintendo or you can do whatever you want to do for a certain amount of time. So again, chunking assignments, we don't want to overwhelm the students when they're coming, um, when they're sitting at the computer and they're looking at asynchronous lessons, we want to make sure that instead of providing a 60-minute lesson, maybe we're providing four 15-minute lessons, really breaking down that lesson in order to um, be able to address those skills and provide opportunities for students to complete activities related to those skills and for teachers to provide feedback. Feedback, again, I know many divisions in Virginia have chosen not to provide grades, but there has to be that constant feedback so that we, again, are addressing where the students are in their activities and making sure that they're completing things correctly and they're getting that feedback like they would in the classroom. So, again, as I mentioned earlier, those office hours and those check-ins from teachers, you know, reaching out to students and parents, I think that's just so important at this time because we, you know, the, the students want to see their teachers, they want to hear from their teachers, and the families that are supporting their students at home need that communication as well. So social emotional support has also been a very hot topic during this time. I know a lot of um, social stories have been created related to the coronavirus, related to distance learning, again, providing that level of support to those students that need that special design instruction through social stories. It's important that they understand, you know, why are they in the situation they're in and having to interact with their teachers, you know, via distance learning platform and they're not seeing necessarily this, the other students in the class, you know, as a whole. So there's a lot of um, creative ways out there that teachers have been providing such lessons. You know, they do record their videos. They're having students record responses and sending them back just to have as much interaction as possible. Teachers need to continue to focus on doing a lot of modeling in lessons. We need to make sure that repetition and that modeling and all of that's available through those lessons so students with disabilities that need that repetition can go back and refer to those things. A lot of, um, you'll see a lot of things related to movement, you know, making sure that students get up I've seen some things where te uh, teachers have encouraged students to create sensory tasks at home. So they get up and they move and they do a little activity and then they can sit back down at the computer. So virtual field trips, webcams, there's been so many things that have been made available in order to meet the needs of students and still be able to provide those engaging lessons and opportunities to meet their needs and maintain their interest. But I think bottom line with all of this, we have to offer grace to families, to students, you know, we don't know the circumstances of every family out there. And we have to ensure that we are providing feedback and we are helping them through whatever their situation is. And, and if we have to provide that grace in order to, you know, get them, you know, do what you can and then, you know, help them through that social emotional support for their student, for their family, just to get through the situation before we're able to resume and come back to school. So that's all I have to share today. <laughs> I 
I have lost audio, so I am not sure if I need to go ahead and get started. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and 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 get on in there. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to to be with you today, um, and and just share a little bit with you on on two separate perspectives. Um, the first one is on the administrative side, and then I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the thinking around our our parents and and making sure that our parents uh, have a have a a level of comfort in doing something brand new to many of them. Uh, so the, there are four primary um, concerns when we think of our IEPs that administrators want, may want to think about and special education uh, departments may want to think about as well. So the first is that um, IEP meetings can be conducted virtually. Um, that is, you know, something that has, is, a, is a major change. Uh, what we want to make sure what we want to make sure of is that um, we we want to ensure that um, the entire team is there. All IEP members are present. So whether it's a Zoom meeting or it's a call, we want to make sure that all all aspects of um, of the team are there. Um, the second big change is that that schools can revise IEP IEPs without an IEP meeting. Now these are typically Small, small changes like placement changes because we're all we, we're we're all now in a placement change. Um, but those placement changes that are stemming from the school closures. Uh, but what you want to make sure of is that you have the appropriate documentation because there is a a notice of changes without IEP form that must be um, approved by the parent. So they can make those smaller changes, um, and it's necessary to make some of those changes but it needs to be done with the approval of the parent. Uh, the next two are really, uh, the last two are, are really timelines. And um, I, I, I love what Dr. Myers Dobbs said about grace uh, because, you know, there is some grace around timelines. Uh, there are two primary timelines, 60 day, uh, the 60 day timeline for initial and reevaluation. And, and that's been extended. And what, each uh, district wants to make sure that they're able to do is they want to make sure that they're able to document why the why the um, why it needs to be extended and um, the, the steps that have been taken to ensure that although there was an extension there is um, there is still um, work and progress toward the uh, initial or the reavow again it, 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 we want to be clear around the documentation if for any reason things we have to we have to explain the rationale on the back end so um, that's going to be very important um, and the other one is uh, the 15 business days to review existing data again that has been um, relaxed but again we again it's very important that we want to make sure that we are documenting um, that that um, progress continues to be made and and why the why that extenuating circumstance or or why the extension was needed. I think we know the extenuating circumstance, but um, we want, we just want to make sure that we are continuing to to make progress toward um, uh, toward all of the aspects of the IEP. Um, uh, briefly, we want to make sure that uh, we are just constantly in communication with parents. Again, we want to communicate and over communicate. Um, and, and make sure that we're collaborating with general ed and special education teachers, even if we're setting up special meetings just between those two groups of teachers to ensure that if we are giving that uh, 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 educational um, experience to all of our students, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of those IEP uh, to our special education uh, and meeting the needs of some of our other exceptional education um, students. And briefly, I think I have about one minute. I'm going to just, <laughs> I'm just going to shoot through some things that we want to be able to to think about when we are talking to our parents. And the, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think our parents are mortified <laughs> of now having to be the teachers, but they they are definitely getting a new and, and great appreciation for the work that many of our teachers do. Um, so we want we want our teachers to really think. Of, we want our our teachers, our parents to really think about um, their their home. Um, what is it that um, 
uh, how, how it's set up, and, and especially we would like them to have a special place for their students. Um, maybe, it's, um, maybe it's in a place that is um, non-traditional, not the, not the bedroom. Maybe it's a corner of the living room that the student sets up, that they have everything that they need, so they now know that this is their area. When I'm there, it's school time, so that's important. Um, I, think, I think this point in time has given our, our parents a, a great opportunity. Oh, that says my time is up. Uh, um, given us a great opportunity to um, to really oh my goodness I'm so sorry. Um, given us a great opportunity for our parents to really review and dig into our IEPs because we want them to really understand the goals that have been set and and not that they didn't uh, prior to that but this really gives them an opportunity to to understand and recalibrate some of those goals. Because we know that they're not teachers, and they know that they're not teachers, right. but we really want them to, to, to really think differently about those goals. So here's, here's an instance. Um, so there may be a goal that says that the child needs to um, uh, get 80% accuracy on 20 specific sight words. Well, I don't think that, I, I don't think that, that is appropriate to, to, to put on the shoulders of a parent. So maybe we reduce that amount of sight words. So maybe we really focus on three to five sight words, and, and we're only working with those sight words fractions of the time that they typically would be. So we're really talking about uh, recalibrating the goals to fit the situation that we are now. Um, and, and the last thing, I, there's a couple more, but the last thing I really would like for us to, to to, to really push our parents on is to really just reach out. Now is a, a very special time for us to really connect and build connections with our parents that we typically would not. Um, be that support person. Be that, be that individual that has the opportunity to take um, something that's very complex, uh, like educating a special, uh, a special education student, and really break that down to its, its, its really, break it down to its um, most simplistic part to give that opportunity to our parents to, to do some of that work and to feel good about the time that they are spending with their child in this um, during the pandemic. So those are just a couple of things that I'd like you to think about on the administrative side, but then as we're working with our parents, some things that we can, we can help our parents do to make this transition for them better. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sears. That yeah. was so informative. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rachel, would you like to just, um, we're going to take some time. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, can you just explain how we're going to do this, Rachel? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Sears, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Myers-Dobbs. So at this point in the webinar, we're going to take questions. And um, if you would use the feature, it's the little person at the bottom of your screen. And when you click on it, it'll say raise your hand. If you raise your hand, that'll let us know that you do have a question and then um, whenever you are able to ask the question, um, please use microphone only um, when speaking. So we'll take questions now. Okay, well, maybe you just need to think about it for a minute, right? Think about yeah. the questions. Um, and if you have, if you want to raise your hand, that's awesome. You know, one thing maybe for both of you could, could answer, um, you know, as a parent myself, just thinking about um, the, the feedback that you have gotten from the parents um, in the state that they're in. You know, Dr. Ronnie Myers' job mentioned, um, you know, the social and emotional support going on. Um, and then Dr. Sears mentioned, um, you know, the IEP and, and having to switch that around a little bit. So how, how have the parents done in, in the reaction to all of this change and really becoming teachers themselves and, and um, having the collaboration and support from your team? Dr. Meyer, Stab, what do you think? Sure. Um, I, and I think it varies depending, again, on the circumstances of the families at home. Um, you know, some of our families have multiple multiple children, so you know they're supporting yeah. more than others in that setting. So again, it goes back to the relationship that the case manager had with that parent prior to all of this occurring. I think some of those relationships have even 
become stronger as a result of the situation. And the case managers had to work very closely with the parent, not only through the process of any um, changes to the IEP to address distance learning, but also in structuring the learning environment, which is now at home, you know, in order for the students to complete the work provided. And, you know, some of the situations where, you know, with visuals or with other supports, like eliminating the distractions and using a timer and those things that parents may not be, have used, they have not, they may not have had a need to use in the home environment, but when you're talking about a child, you know, right. doing schoolwork when they're at home, they're going to need those accommodations that they had when they were in the school setting. So it's just, and I think Dr. Sears mentioned that, building that environment at home, where is the best place for your child to work and what accommodations are they going to need to support them to get that specially designed instruction through that distance learning plan. Great, great answer. Uh, Dr. Sears, could what I, are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. If I could add, I, I completely agree with you, Dr. myers Um our, our experiences have been uh, varied as well. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, this, this gives credence to uh, building relationships from, from, from day one, whether it is, whether we were in our traditional setting or in um, this new virtual setting, but our relationships and our, in, our interactions with um, uh, parents have been better if during those initial weeks of, uh, of the closure, there were calls made that had nothing to do with school. Just how are you doing? You know, how is your student? Um, this is crazy. Let's commiserate, and I'll be back in touch with you. Um, you know, because that really, I think, um, uh, humanized the teachers, and it and it gave a an opportunity for our Here parents to say, oh, oh, wow, they are just, you know, they are just like us. You know, they're nervous, they're scared, they are, they don't know what next steps are. Um, but we are, we are, are now in a position where we are moving from, um, well, maybe we'll have to do this um, virtually until to a space where we're saying, yeah, we're, we're going to have to deliver content in a new way. Yeah. So uh, many of our teachers that have, um, that, that built some of those early relationships now have a better connection to our yes. parents to, um, to really begin. And, and I hate to say, I hate to say push. But, but gently um, allow them to be to take more control over uh, the actual education that's happening uh, over the actual right. instruction that's happening in the home. So um, you know and even if even I, that would be my biggest um, biggest suggestion to, uh, to teachers is to just reach out on a, uh, on a human on a person to person level uh, to that parent, um, whether it's a letter, uh, whether it's um, you know, just a, a, a five-minute phone call and, and, and just saying, hey, how are you doing? How is the student doing? I miss them. Um, you know, everything will be okay. Right. I'll get back to you soon about next steps. Right. But then those follow-ups are really the most important part is now, now you're really kind of laying down some of the groundwork, uh, some, of the, some of the specifics that need to be done to make sure that those students have some semblance of of uh, instruction or, or, or intervention during, during this uh, school closure time. Thank you, Dr. Sears. I do see that Gretchen has her hand raised, so just give me a second. Okay, go ahead, Gretchen. You should be able to use your microphone or type in the chat. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I just had a quick question. What if you don't get any response from a parent? What would be the next step for a teacher to do? You need to continue to make those um, attempts and you definitely need to document, you know, what you, you know, when you have called, have you tried to mail something? You know, I would use multiple ways to try to communicate with the parent, whether it's call, whether it's email, where it's U.S. mail, but document what you have done. I think in this situation, we've realized that some students have left the area possibly to go, 
move in with other family members or may have left for any other reason. Maybe they have a sick family member somewhere else. So they just, I think, again, just we have emphasized to our teachers, document, document, document. Okay, thank you so much. Could I, and, and, and I may add on to that just, just briefly. Um, in, in Petersburg, we have realized, and, and this is staggering if you ask me, um, via uh, telephone um, uh, mail that's been returned, that we don't have tabs on about 18% of our kids. Wow. I mean, and that means that means nothing. Um, like, like um, we couldn't, like, we don't know how they're getting meals. We don't know, you know, we don't know anything. And, and that's pretty scary. So what we tried to do is use uh, unconventional methods. Um, so we are actually uh, putting together, uh, and it's already started, but we are actually trying to, to kind of put a, a campaign together so we're using uh, Facebook. We're saying, hey, um, if, if you haven't heard from us, please reach out to us. Um, and, and that may mean just a, uh, and, and, and giving an email address or giving maybe a, a phone number at the school that, that, um, that someone can call uh, and then having someone check that once a week or, or twice a week. So what it does is, is it at, at, a, at a minimum, those folks that, that may, those students that may be living with um, uh, grandparents, or they may be in between homes, they may be in hotels, um, they still have an opportunity to know that, hey, we're looking for you. And, and, um, and they, we didn't realize that people don't really come to our, they don't come to our website. We were thinking, oh, we've got this great website. Follow us <laughs> on Facebook. So we started kind of moving everything to Facebook um, and Twitter. And, um, and that's how we're pushing information out. And we're saying, hey, we, we want to be in touch with you. If, if, if we haven't been in touch with you, we don't know. So if you haven't heard from us, please, if you haven't heard from, from us, please call us. I think that's what, uh, they said more smooth than that, but that's what it kind of means. So we're really just asking our parents to reach out to us. Um, and, and again, I think what you're saying is, is important. You hate to kind of say document, but we really have to say, um, we are trying. We are reaching out to our parents. So, yeah, I, even if you haven't, um, maybe try to kind of reverse engineer uh, parents reaching out to you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, just want to ask if any of the remaining participants do have any more questions. Okay, well, I have enjoyed this so much. I have learned so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hunter, Dr. Sears, Dr. Myers Dobb. This has been inspiring and so helpful. Um, oh, Rachel, oh. Would <laughs> awesome. Um, Rachel, would you like to add anything at the end? Uh, just if anybody has any questions, they can contact us at Regent University School of Ed. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Hunter. Rachel Copeland is an expert in the licensure area. She can help you if you have licensure questions that could affect your uh, child or your relative or your friend who has an IEP and is um, maybe in the mountains with in Petersburg with Dr. Sears, um, but can reach us through Regent University. Um, we're welcome for questions, and if you're interested in any program information, I've got it all. <laughs> yes, you do, Dr. Hunter. <laughs> So much. We're going to end our webinar here, but this has been a delight to have you. Um, we have more seminars coming up um, over the next couple weeks. You can contact us of what we have going on. But um, thanks again. Take care. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Mm -hmm.